a bad hair transplant is a million times. It's a million times worse than having no hair in your head. It would be nice to be able to harvest hair from somebody, grow it in a lab, reproduce thousands of them, and then transplant it back into the person's scalp. So I had one man who had, he had a bald head. He got a micropigmentation done. And the, it was dark, sort of dark brown, blackish when he had it done. And eventually, after about six months, it turned green. There is a family in South America who have a genetic absence of DHT. And none of the men ever lose their hair. I, I think there's no room whatsoever for salesmen from either Ireland or uh, Turkey or wherever mm. to get involved in selling operations to vulnerable people. Mm. If the guy in the mirror, because of his hair loss, and particularly a receding hairline, if he's not seeing the image that he's expecting to see, a discontent arises. My oldest patient who came in to me looking for a hair transplant, believe it or not, was 92 years old. Dr. Morris Collins, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Connor. It's good to meet you. So tell me, Dr. Collins, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, so I'm a dub uh, on the north side. Um, had a very, very happy childhood on Griffith Avenue and went to Marino School and Belvedere College and um, had no clue what I wanted to do when I left school. My ambition was to be an airline pilot, um, and I didn't quite make the cut in the Aer Lingus application. So I went to a career guidance expert, interestingly, and he recommended either accountancy or medicine. And medicine had never entered my mind. Um, but I have, I love physics and science subjects. So I decided to go into medicine, and I must say it was the best decision ever. Um, so you studied medicine, and, and why did you, when did you specialize in hair restoration? How did you make that leap? Okay, so you go to university, you study medicine, you do your work in the hospitals, mm. then you do sit your final medical exam, and you're then a qualified doctor. And then the pathways diverge. Uh, some people will go into family medicines, Others will go into public health, others will go into hospital medicine. And hospital medicine always appealed to me. I loved it. Um, and even though I had access to a good family practice to enter very easily, yeah. um, I decided to go down the surgical route. And that's a very long pathway, Gunnar. Um, 20 years later, um, I trained as a general surgeon first. And then I specialized in head and neck surgery and eventually ended up practicing as an ear, nose and throat surgeon for nearly 20 years in Blackrock Clinic. And I had a very successful practice there. I treated personally over 33,000 patients um, during my 20 years in the hospital. Didn't operate on them all, but that was my database. And I wanted to, didn't want to retire, but I wanted to have a change. Mm. So a friend, a friend of mine, interestingly, asked me to recommend somebody to do a hair transplant. So I said, absolutely no problem. I have lots of plastic surgical colleagues in Black Rock and the Matter, and I get one of them to do it for you. And as far as I was concerned, that was it. And then lo and behold, I found that there was nobody in Ireland doing hair transplantation at I would, what I would call an ethical level. There were little basement um, shops, as I call them, mm. with uh, disreputable salesmen selling hair transplants to very vulnerable people. There's no actually qualified surgeon who had gone to a surgical uh, training was actually doing it in Ireland. So I 
got eventually got a surgeon in Paris to operate on the friend who made the original inquiry. And I traveled to Paris with him to observe the surgery. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Connor, you take the hair from the back of the head, you put it in the front of the head, you charge them the fortune, and <laughs> oh, you know, wow. And it looked so easy. But it was five full years before I did my first transplant. And I was a fully qualified surgeon. Technically, it's incredibly challenging to do it properly. Mm. Any fool can take a piece of hair from here and stick it in there. You could train a monkey to do it. Mm. The the um, artistic elements of this are very, very challenging. And remember, if we do, say, two and a half or 3,000 graft transfers in a day, these are actually transplants. So you take something out of the body, it's deprived of its oxygen and nutrition for a period of time, and then you put it back into the body and you expect it to grow. Mm. And it's to me, it's a small miracle that the thing actually works because you're, you're depriving the organ and the hair follicle is a little mini organ. Mm. You can talk about heart transplants, liver transplants, kidneys, etc., etc. But a hair follicle is an independent organ with its own blood supply and nerves and control systems. And it reproduces itself every three to five years. So it's actually a highly complex organ. Um, I'm admiring your big mop of hair there. And... Uh, <laughs> You but know, you know, the, 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 people at your age have that. I know, and this is the thing. This is one of the things that interests me, Morris. Is it's like it is it is is it inevitable? Is hair loss inevitable? No. The statistics are: at the age of fifty, roughly fifty percent of the male population of the world will have it. Mm. So, young men going through puberty and then approaching the age of 20, the rough statistic is 20% of the population. And then it goes up by 10% per decade. Some men will accept their hair loss, premature, get on with their life, and that's it. But my oldest patient who came in to me looking for a hair transplant, believe it or not, was 92 years old. And his hair loss was still a concern to him. Wow. Immaculately dressed in a beautiful suit. Um, very, very smart man. You'd think he was about 60. But I checked with his son who was with him, and he, he was definitely 92 years old. And his words were, I'm worried about my hair loss going forwards. <laughs> I, I just love to have that optimism. <laughs> so would I. Did, he, did, you, did you help him? We, his skin was too fragile to do a hair transplant. Mm. He did have some hair that we could have transplanted. But with grooming and products, we were able, to, and some medicines, we were actually able to help him to overcome the concerns he had. And quite honestly, at 92, doing an operation for cosmetic reasons on a man of that age, even though he enjoyed very good health, mm. I felt it was better to try the medical options first, and they worked very well for him. He was very grateful, and the concerns that he had are not gone. Some of the um, the older methods, like my father lost his hair when he was thirty. Um, he's eighty six now, and he's worn a weave all his life. Um, the what I know you're not a psychologist, but what what do you think the psychological and emotional impacts? are in your experience when i um was looking at going into hair transplantation i practiced microsurgery throughout my ear nose and throat so i thought now i have the microsurgical skills i'm used to working with a microscope every day mm. and hair transplantation is done with, with um, head loops and mic uh, magnification so i said right perfect i'm the perfect man for the job what took me completely by surprise were the psychological implications of the patients that I was dealing with and the phenomenal vulnerability that can happen in some men, not all men, but quite a high percentage. 
And when I was in school, I read a poem called Death, the Leveler. So when we die, we're all the same. And believe you me, hair loss makes every man the same. It, may, it doesn't make any difference if you're out sweeping the streets or emptying dustbins or you're a professor of surgery or you're a senior politician or a businessman. When it comes to hair, every man is the same if he is affected by it. Mm. And it's the psychological aspects of it that are the key elements. I I believe that you and I have a vision of ourselves within our mind. And when we look in a mirror or we see a photograph or a reflection, that image must match what we're looking at to a certain extent. Mm. We always want to be a little bit younger. But if the guy in the mirror, because of his hair loss, and particularly a receding hairline, if he's not seeing the image that he's expecting to see, a discontent arises. Mm. And it's it's nothing to do with vanity. My, my patients are not vain men. They don't come along saying, I want you to make me look better, but that I want to feel better. And when I do a transplant on somebody, the words I hear are, my self-esteem has gone up, my sense of well-being, my contentment with my life. I don't think about my hair anymore. If somebody puts a camera in front of me now, I don't run away. Uh, it's it's all psychological, the, the benefits. Mm. Connor, I'm just going to divert for a second there. That I, I, I'm just going to talk to you with, with when things pop into my mind. Yeah, go I've, for it. I have three patients who are visually impaired mm. to the extent that they haven't seen their hair transplants. Wow. I find this fascinating. And one of them is a psychologist, and I asked him, I said, why would a blind man have a hair transplant? Mm. You never see it. Mm. And he said, Morris, these are my eyes, my fingers. My The tips of my fingers are very sensitive because I feel things. Mm. He said, I hated the feel of my shiny bald head. So he said, I now run my fingers to my hair. Mm. He said, no idea how good that makes me feel. And also, he said, even though I don't see myself, my friends tell me I look well and I look healthy and I look younger. Mm. And they're the principal things that people will notice. Very few will actually notice the hair transplant. Mm. But they will perceive a change. And it's always a positive change. So we're, we're talking about not just the cosmetic effect. We're, we're talking about an, a, a very serious psychological, emotional effect as a result. That, that's, a, that's extraordinary. I, I've had people in, you know, what, if you like, uh, senior medics, senior politicians, senior bankers, senior businessmen, these guys running huge companies, running hospitals. And they'll turn around to me and they say, Morris, you have no concept in your mind what you have actually done to help me with the enjoyment of my life. Mm. I was troubled by this. I don't think about it anymore. Mm. And I'm deeply, deeply grateful to you for the help you've given me. Mm. It's not thanks for the hair transplant. It's how they feel. And this, this gets me to, a, I'm just going off an attack here. Mm. I'm a fully qualified surgeon, and all our doctors in the clinic here are fully qualified doctors. Uh, I happen to be a surgeon, and most of my staff are surgeons who deal with the hair transplant. But I, I think there's no room whatsoever for salesmen from either Ireland or uh, Turkey or wherever. Mm to get involved in selling operations to vulnerable people. Mm. It's, it's something that I feel deeply, deeply strongly about. And I think anybody, the one piece of advice, if I was to give anybody from this interview is, if your hair loss is a concern to you, go and see a properly qualified expert in the area who's a medical background, not mm. necessarily me. We're very busy and we're, we have a very, very good practice. But please get proper advice. Don't talk in an aeroplane and rush off to Turkey or somewhere else and have a cheap transplant. Because 
a bad hair transplant is a million times, and I don't use mm-hmm. that word million loosely, it's a million times worse than having no hair in your head. If if you happen to have a good bone structure and you shave your head, uh, like Andre Agassi, the uh, tennis player, when Sinead O'Connor um, shaved her head, I mean, she looked absolutely beautiful. Mm. Good bone structure and very strong eyebrows. So some people will get away with this. They just shave their head, accept their hair loss, and get on with it and live with it. But sadly, for an awful lot of men, that's not possible. Um, Morris, what what causes hair loss? So I, I we principally deal with male pattern hair loss. Mm. That would be over ninety percent of our patients. Uh, females do get a pattern of hair loss, but the precise cause of it is not known. But getting back to your question, um, when a boy goes through puberty, um, there's increased testosterone in the circulation and a metabolite of a breakdown of testosterone is called dihydrotestosterone, or DHT for short. Mm. And that, if you have the genetic predisposition and you have that hormone in your circulation, then some of the hair on your head will become vulnerable to the balding process. Most men, when they go to puberty, will get a little receding of the temples here, mm. and then it stops. If you have the genetic predisposition, the hair loss will then proceed on. And the there is a family in South America who have a genetic absence of DHT, and none of the men ever lose their hair. So the Merck organization many years ago in the States, the pharmaceutical company, mm. found this group of people, and they figured that it was the DHT hormone. So they developed a drug, a DHT blocker, which reduced the DHT level and that's still the mainstay of treatment that we use on patients, the medical treatment. So to answer your question briefly, time, the male sex, the genetic predisposition, and circulation testosterone. Um, women... Let me tell you a funny one. Sorry, come yeah, Let me tell you one. In the Vatican, there's a choir called a castrati which is self-explanatory, <laughs> many, many years ago. And these were young men who were singing in the Sistine Chapel, and it was the in thing to have your kid in the choir. Mm. So before they went to puberty, the young men were castrated to keep their high alto voices, fairly mm. radical stuff. Mm. The only benefit they got, well, two benefits, they kept their voice, but they also kept their hair. Mm. None of them went bold. <laughs> so what what I'm hearing is um the link between testosterone right yeah. um it's the fundamental one and just out of curiosity could you say could you surmise then or postulate that somebody with higher levels of testosterone would experience more likely experience hair loss no that that's a common myth mm. um I'm in my latter years now. I'm not going to tell you my age, but I train in the gym six days a week and I'm deadlifting 165 kilos at the moment. That has wow. pushed my testosterone up. When you do um, heavy exercise resistance training, mm. the testosterone level goes up by 15%. And there's a myth that when men train in the gym, they have high levels of testosterone, which they do. But that makes them bolder. And that's not correct. Mm. Studies were done many, many years ago in the early days of hair loss when it was being studied. Mm. And it's found that the levels of testosterone or absence of it were not related to the degree of hair loss. Mm. It's the metabolite of the testosterone, DHT, that causes the vulnerability. And also, you can have variation in. Say there's five boys in a family. Mm. You'll have one of them shiny bald, and then at the other end of the spectrum, one of them with a full head of hair. So 
the levels of testosterone do not um, right. dictate the degree of boldness. But you have to have testosterone. If if um, a male is going to go on, undergo a gender change and um, has his testicles removed to get a become a female, um, and he has a receding hairline before that happens, the recession of the hairline will stop at that point and it won't progress any further. So you must have testosterone, but the levels do not dictate the degree of hair loss that you have. Um, you mentioned female clients. Is it is it primarily alopecia, something like alopecia that would... would women, women, women can get a pattern of hair loss. The pattern is completely different to men. Mm. The cause of it, we still don't know precisely. Been studied for many years, but we still don't know. Mm. They do respond to a drug called minoxidil and spironolactone a diuretic, and um, some of them do very well. And um, hair transplantation can be done on females, but an awful lot of females now that we're seeing have what's called the scarring alopecias, mm. and this is a, a dermatological. Uh, problem. It's not something that um, you know we deal with. We're we're primarily a surgical practice, but uh, we have a dermatologist in house who's a member of our staff who deals with this. But um, it's a very very um, disconcerting uh, problem for women. Mm. Connor, you know, people believe that it's worse for women to lose hair than men. Mm. It's a complete myth. Hair loss affects both men and women equally, and why shouldn't it? Mm. Um, people think the concept of a bald woman is worse than a bald man. But in the man who's looking in the mirror, he's just as upset as any woman who is losing her hair. Um, okay, so when should a patient, uh, a prospective patient, consider an intervention? Okay, so... Just say the the younger the better mm. for getting an opinion on how to deal with the hair loss, and I a lot of I see a lot of young men in their late teens, early twenties coming in, and they notice a little bit of recession in the temples, or somebody make a comment that they're getting um, lightness of the crown area at the back of the head. Mm. And it's, it's a very subtle change initially. And if you can get a young man like that, they have the option of considering the medical treatments to bring them through that vulnerable period of their growing up, mm. mature, maturing, before they make the big decision of whether to have a hair transplant or not. So I, I always say, Conrad, that this is a non-fatal condition. Mm. Nobody has died from baldness. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs the medicines and nobody needs a hair transplant. Mm -hmm. And the only person who should advise you whether you have a hair transplant or not is the man in the mirror mm -hmm. after he's got the proper advice from a professional. Now, I sound very stuffy saying that, but a bad hair transplant is a million times worse mm -hmm. than being bald or losing your hair. Nobody wants to lose their hair, and there's the vast majority of men, there's an awful lot we can do to help them. Mm. But I'm seeing patients who are rushing off to commercial clinics in Ireland and the UK, but principally Turkey. Mm. They're coming back absolutely mutilated. And the, the donor area, the back and sides of the scalp has been destroyed, and there's basically very little we can do to help them. And had they come along, got a proper opinion from a doctor who knows something about hair, mm. they would have been advised not to go to have any hair transplant anywhere. anywhere. I mm. would only operate on maybe one in four, one in five patients I see. Um, some of them are not suitable. They don't have enough donor hair. Some of them are too young to consider such a serious step. Mm. And then some of them are eminently suitable and 
I recommend surgery straight away. Mm. But I think the proper assessment of a patient, the psychological impact that their hair loss is having on them, nobody can give them back a full head of hair. That's mm. a complete myth. Um, and there's an illusion put out there by the Turkish clinics then you can go to Turkey, have a great weekend with the lads. It's almost like a stag weekend. Three mm. or four heading off together, come back with the full head of hair. Oh, Radida, and it's an absolute unmitigated disaster. Plus, there's no possibility for follow up care, right? Because you're 4,000 miles away, and you know, it's. It's not only that, they, they, there's very little donor hair mm. to actually be able to do any repair work. If I can revert back to some of the basics of hair loss, uh, Connor, um, when nature gives you a full head of hair, there's roughly 100,000 hairs on your head. Mm. And the one little grouping is called follicles. And there's an average of two hairs in each follicle. Mm. Half of them on the top and half of them on the back and sides. The ones at the back and side and the horseshoe you see on bald men are less vulnerable to the balding process. So what we do is we harvest hair from that immune hair, if you like, and then relocate it to a vulnerable area or a cosmetically important area, mm. and then we reinforce that to improve the appearance for that patient, depending on what their requirements are. Mm. It's pretty much a personal thing. The, the bottom line for any hair transplant is Nobody has enough donor hair at the back and sides to densely cover the whole top of the head. It just does not exist. And if anybody tells you this, they're lying and you run. And that's where we're limited in the amount of hair. And nobody has yet started growing hair properly in a laboratory that could be used for clinical purposes. Mm. Whoever comes up with that is going to make trillions. Yeah, that's one of my questions. Um, so before I, I want to ask you about that, but before before I do, can I just ask you to explain the difference between FUE and FUT? Sure. So if I see somebody and I assess the back of their head and they have a big wide horseshoe here, mm. and they uh, fulfill all the criteria that we will decide on that they're suitable for a hair transplant and they make the decision that I'm going to have a hair transplant. There are two ways of harvesting the hair from the back and sides. If you're somebody like me in my age group who's never going to shave their head or go for the ultra short Johnny Sexton cut of the current mm. year, you know, it's basically shaved every week. Mm. It, any little surgical incision on that shaved head would become visible as a linear mark. So in that case, we take out the grafts with a special device one by one. Mm. Tiny little micro dots of scar tissue scattered widely over a broad surface area. And with a short haircut, they're not visible. Mm. And the reduction in density is usually not visible. You only notice hair loss when you've lost 50% of the hair. Mm. So when somebody gets the bald spot here, they've lost in excess of 50%. So if you reverse that principle, you can then remove, say, 30, 35% of the hair without it being noticeable that the person is going bald there. The reduction in density is usually not noticeable at all. And one of the problems that when men are losing hair on top of their head, this stuff grows crazy. The term short back and sides is the equivalent of what people used to do in the old days of the comb over. Mm. The old days, like your dad did, he wore a hairpiece mm. and has successfully done so. Um, and if it's well maintained, it can help an awful lot of men. Indeed, Bobby Charlton is famous for his comb over. Mm. And a big slick across this hair is let grow really long and then the public find that very disconcerting and it blows in the wind they're very weather dependent doesn't work mm. 
the modern man to take the emphasis away from here will trim this really tight mm. and then let the hair grow so the disproportionate growth is not as visible as it was. So if we have somebody like that who has an ultra short haircut, if I do the traditional FUT, take a strip of hair yeah. and scale, then the linearity of the scar tissue even though the amount of scar tissue is considerably less, because it's not spread over a broad, a broad surface area, mm. it's not as visible. Does that explain it? Yeah, well, one is follow, follow, follicular the, extraction versus the, the transplant and taking the strip, right? So the strip, in the strip, if somebody has longish hair, say like yourself or myself, mm. There's a sweet spot in the middle of the donor area where the most immune hair to the balding process is located. Mm. And if if somebody has elasticity in their skin here, I can take about the width of your finger out and then draw the edges together. So I then have a strip that could be 20 centimeters long of dense, thick, immune hair. Mm. And then we have technicians in the laboratory here who dissect each individual hair follicle out one by one under a microscope. And then the hairs are relocated into the thinning area in the front or wherever we're going to put it one by one. So the, the, the recipient area, the area where we put the hair, always gets single follicles, be it FUE or FUT. Mm. It's just the harvesting is the mm. difference. And what's the prognosis then after the transplant? I mean, how long could you expect the, the hair to be healthy and sustainable? Or what, what would your if, perspective be? If the, And this is where the expert is needed. Mm. If the hair is taken from the, the non-vulnerable area, that should be on the person's head for the rest of their life. Okay, mm. because where that's what I refer to as the sweet spot. Mm. With the FUE, you're harvesting up to the areas where the boldness can get worse. Mm. So, one of the possible disadvantages of FUE is if you have a very young man in his early twenties, and you don't know what the natural history of his boldness is going to be whether he's going to progress to being shiny bald or he'll just lose his bottom amount of hair over his lifetime. And that's where the family history comes in and it's very relevant. Mm. It does. It's not black and white, but it does give us a guide. So to summarize that, FUE is for people who like to groom their hair ultra short mm. or they have very tight scalps where I can't get the strip out. FUT is to harvest 100% of the most immune hair from the sweet spot in the center of the donor area where you know you're going to get the best quality hair. And then the length of their hair will cover up any little surgical mark underneath. The scar should be about a millimeter wide. And so, you know, even with a blade two or three, it's not visible. Um. What's your perspective on new treatments like micropigmentation? Micropigmentation has been around for a long time. And mm. I remember about 12 years ago, we got some of our technicians trained up in the process. And we I thought it would be very good for the repair of scar tissue. And we um, started doing it principally on scars. But we've since stopped doing it principally because there's no regulation in the pigmentation that's used. It's basically a tattoo. That's all it is. Mm. And the tattoos um, can change color in scar tissue. So I had one man who had, he had a bald head. He got a micropigmentation done. And the, it was dark, sort of dark brown, blackish when he had it done. And eventually after about six months, it turned green. So he would have looked spectacular on St. Patrick's Day. Mm. It's the only day he could go out in public. 
and he puts pseudocreme is from his child's baby bottom care on his scalp before he went out to work every day to hide the green tattoo. It it's it's a unidimensional. So hair is three dimensional, and it just doesn't look right. It looks like a machine put it on. You can't get a natural feathering that you can get. Um, so I found it uniformly disappointing. And I was concerned about the lack of regulation of mm. the uh, pigments that were being used. So we, I made a decision not to do it. We tried it. We tried it in scar tissue. We tried it in balding skin. And it didn't, didn't meet the cosmetic standards that we have in our clinic. So we don't do it anymore. Um, and you mentioned the artificial side, the, the potential for, you know, if some point in the future somebody can artificially invent something. Uh, how close are we to something like that, do you think? Now, our dermatologist works very closely with Professor Des Tobin in the Charles Institute in UCD. Des Tobin will be considered one of the top three hair researchers in the world. He's a superb academic. He's um, got a unit in the science department in UCD in Belfield called the Charles Institute, where he's got PhD fellows doing hair on research, re research on hair. So we send samples of human hair to him on a weekly basis from our patients who volunteer it with ethical approval, etc. We don't take the hair without their written consent. Um, so we're right at the cutting edge of the research world. And I'm disappointed to say that there's no magic breakthrough coming around the corner. Mm. Whenever Des tells us that um, he's made a breakthrough, I'll sell everything I have. I'll buy, buy every share in that company. <laughs> and then I'll tell all my patients. <laughs> So well, I mean, it makes, it makes, tell me as well. It's the holy grail. It really mm. is the holy grail. And as I said to, I always say to patients, if if I had the cure for this condition, I would not be sitting here talking to you. I'd I'd have a company called Y instead of X. Mm. I'd be so wealthy. <laughs> um. So I'm I, I'm from your answer. I'm guessing we're still a while away, right? Long, long way away. There's, I can't see any magic. When I started this, we, we celebrated the 20th year of opening the clinic last month. Mm. So 20 years ago, I 25 years ago, I started getting interested in hair. And I was told that hair cloning would be a matter of a standard thing in any laboratory in three years' time. Stay with my ear, nose, and throat surgery. Don't get involved in hair. You'll be out of a job. And that was 25 years ago. Mm. There is still not. Hair, hair is an incredibly complex organ that replicates itself every three to five years. So I'm looking at you on screen. You have a fabulous head of hair, which I've admired already. <laughs> all you. of that hair, believe it or not, Connor, that you have and I'm looking at wasn't there 10 years ago. That's all brand new hair. You, you lose about 100 hairs every day, and then 100 new ones regenerate and grow mm. back. So the, the hair goes into a hibernation state for about three months, and then the root sends up a new hair. Mm. So um, the, the cure is not around the corner. And there's a cliche in hair which says, if it appears to be too good to be true, it usually is. And another another interesting thing, uh, Connor. I recently, I a patient was asking me about treatments. What are the medical treatments? What can you do to help me? Mm. So we went, we went into Google and put in hair loss treatment as a search term, and I got three point one billion results. So every snake oil salesman is out there trying to flog something, mm. and they just don't work. There are medical treatments, which I'll talk to you about if you'd like me to, mm. because a lot of men who don't have enough hair or I feel they're too young for hair transplant, 
we can help them with medical treatments that have been around for a long, long time now. They're approved by the regulatory authorities, both in Ireland and the States, the UK, all around the world, for the stabilization of hair loss. I have thousands of men who benefit from this. And if I do a transplant on somebody, the transplanted hair doesn't help the native hair, which is still vulnerable to the balding process. Mm. So it's important that you try and at least inform the patient of the medical treatments that have a 90% chance of stabilizing his hair loss. So, so the so transplant, not, yeah, it's sorry. not just the transplant on its yeah. own. So it, it, the transplant is part of a bouquet, if you like, a, a collective of, if somebody comes to you, they, they there's a big discussion, a wider discussion of, the, are there supplements, Dr. Collins, as well, that you can work Supp with? Supplements don't work. Okay. Hair loss is not a biotin deficiency. Mm. I, I always refer to the, the tragic figures of the um, people coming out of the concentration camps after the Second World War when the Americans went in. These skeletal figures were barely able to walk. Mm. They were literally skin and bone, literally, and some of them didn't survive. But they weren't bald. They had poor quality hair on their heads but they weren't bald. Mm. So male pattern hair loss, as I've previously said, is due to dihydrotestosterone, and that's it. Mm. It's not a nutritional deficiency. The quality of your hair can be affected by your state of nutrition, obviously, mm. but the quantity of hair is not. So, it's, so male pattern hair loss or female pattern hair loss is not a nutritional deficiency. And taking all the various snake oils that are sold left, right, and center. Mm. Um, there's a product that was developed. I, I'm not going to mention it just in case it's not appropriate. But it was developed by a man in Galway uh, by a company called Life's Too Good. He subsequently sold the company for $150 million because he targeted the female hair loss community in the United States. There isn't one active ingredient. It's a collection of pieces of shark cartilage and other vitamins and nutrients. Mm. But it has no, in double-blind placebo-controlled trials, mm. it has no benefit whatsoever. And he flogged the company for $150 million. It's the best marketing expert I've ever come across. Uh, and you mentioned that nutrition can affect the quality of the yeah. hair. What what recommendations would you have there, Morris? Cut out all processed foods out of your diet and eat the food that our great-grandparents ate. Mm. That's very simplistic. But I could spend three hours discussing nutrition. But there's no specific hair loss diet that I recommend. Mm. I'm just appalled at the massive increase in diabetes and obesity and metabolic diseases that is spreading worldwide due to processed foods and our appalling state of nutrition. And of course, hair quality is going to be affected by that. And if people are iron deficient because they're not eating enough meat or they're not taking enough iron in, in their diet, um, then they can get hair shedding. But it's not, that's not male pattern hair loss. That's not the condition that we deal with. Um, okay, so post. Connor, there's one area which I'd like to address is the medical issues because there's, there's always this big focus on hair transplantation. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, it's a growing industry worldwide. It's been highly commercialized by commercial clinics. Mm. The, the FUE has become very popular, and we do both uh, procedures in the company here. And sometimes we'll do FUE and then do an FUT on the patient on their next surgery. Some people would have more than two or three surgeries throughout mm. their life. Um, the best example of a patient, if somebody goes onto our website, 
is an actor named James Nesbitt. Mm. And to help young men cope with the stress of their hair loss went very public many years ago. And I've done, and I'm not breaking any privacy rules here. He's very open about it. Um, I've done five separate FUT operations on him over a 12-year period. We transplanted over 11,000 grafts from his very abundant donor area. And he's taking both of the medical treatments that are um, approved for male pattern hair loss. And the man looks phenomenal. If you look at any photographs of him, he's, he's done spectacularly well. Now, not everybody does as well as him. But what I'm finding is that young men are coming back from Turkey and other countries. The medical treatments are not mentioned to them at all. The commercial interest wants them to continue to lose more hair, and then they come back for more hair transplants. Mm. And because the donor hair is so limited in amount in relation to the degree of baldness that most men develop, mm. I strongly encourage people not to, I don't tell them to take the medicines, but I tell them, unless you treat your hair loss, your native hair will continue to get progressively worse mm. in time. The rate at which it happens varies from person to person. But I've never in 20 years ever seen somebody spontaneously regrow hair on their head due to pattern baldness. just doesn't happen. Um, in terms of, say, post-op care right um what would the what would the advice there be is is it extensive is it a lot of work that people have to do or no you have to be a bit particular mm. if you consider what we're doing we take this tiny little micro scalp which we manufacture in house mm. to fit a particular patient's hair root and they're barely visible you need to look them under a microscope mm. And we make a tiny little incision parallel to their existing hair, so it grows in the right direction. The skin then grips this, and over a 14-day period, the body produces a glue-like substance called fibrin that glues the root into position, and then 14 days later, you can pull that hair. The hair will separate from the root, but the root is embedded permanently. Mm. So for 14 days, you have to be incredibly careful that mm. you don't scratch your head Itchy, yeah. or wear a motorbike helmet that's loose in your head and it's flopping around. But we have very specific written instructions that we give our patients mm. and then our nursing staff instruct them that day and then the day after. And we do a, a, a checkup when we're removing the suture 10 days later or a week later. And then we do a six-month follow-up. And, you know, we've we've over 34,000 patients registered in our database. And patient number one from 20 years ago is still attending the clinic for regular follow-up. Mm. So we have an ongoing care system for our patients. But if somebody, the, 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 I think what's behind your question is, if somebody has the FUE process, in the majority of patients, we have to shave the head completely because the hair grafts are so tiny. And to get the instrument over the hair as it comes out of the skin, mm. we have to shave it right down. In the FUT process, we want your hair as long as yours is at the moment. So if you were going to come in and have a hair transplant, I would tell you not to cut your hair. And we lift the hair take the hair out from the back, and then the hair flips down over it. Mm. And some patients go back to work two, three days later, and nobody notices. Mm. Connor, I'm sorry for jumping around. Let, let me tell you a fascinating thing. Mm. Everybody's so conscious, people are going to notice I've had a hair transplant. Mm. There's a big concern there. Nobody notices. They tell them, you look well, you look healthy, you've lost weight, you look younger but nobody notices. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was a kind of a strange stigma that, that people uh, would feel almost humiliated if they got, like, where, where did that come from? That comes from the old days of the plug rats. Mm. Your dad, very wisely, didn't have the big clumps of hair that looked like a Barbie doll yard brush 
Mm. Ridiculous, horrendous, absolutely. All mm. you can do is shave them every day so they don't grow. And and even, you know, men men who have a hairpiece like your dad are Elton John, and they look after them properly. They can look absolutely amazing mm. And hairpieces. We don't do hairpieces, but the standards of them have gone up hugely. But they're very, as your dad would tell you, they're very expensive to maintain properly. Mm. Women are fabulous at doing it. You know, if a woman's getting chemotherapy for breast cancer, she'll groom and look after the hairpiece that she's wearing if she's going through chemo. Mm. She can look stunning. Mm. Whereas men, half the men who wear them, it looks like a divot sitting mm. on top of their head. Well, I could, I tell, yeah. we never saw our father um, up until about three months ago without that weave. Not in the morning, not at night. Never. So I was always aware of the psychological impact of it from, from a very early age. I don't even know if my mother <laughs> even saw him without, although she did insist on him re removing it recently. And, you know, he's, he's 86 now, but uh, yeah, that was 56 years he was wearing. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that gives you a better understanding than the average person would be. Mm. I, I can fully understand that. Connor, in in within the first year of me starting, I was I was starting a new specialty in Ireland. Nobody else had done it. Mm. And an older woman came into me in her eighties, wearing a hairpiece, and she wanted to have a hair transplant. Do you know why? When she died, she didn't want to be in the coffin and somebody knocked the hairpiece yeah. sideways. And her her concern was so bad that she was considering having a hair transplant before she died so that she'd look well in the coffin. The, the psychology of this mm. is what still got me working. I, I, I've i never enjoyed a branch of medicine or found it so challenging, mm. this, this area. Um, another interesting story, a young man in his 20s married with two children, and it was your mom's never seen your dad's head. This young man wears a baseball hat to cover his hair loss, and his wife has never seen it, his head. They have two kids, they've been married for years, and she has never seen the top of his head. He wears it in bed, he wears it everywhere. Nobody has ever seen the top of his head. I would lo I'd love to um, understand more. Uh, maybe I'll talk to a psychologist about that. Because it's that is debilitating. Like, that's a very serious, you know, issue. Patients say to me, it, Morris, it's like getting out of jail. Mm. You you have no, you know, professors of surgery have said to me, you have no concept. You can't imagine what you have done to change my life. I don't think about my hair anymore, whereas I couldn't walk past a mirror or a pane of glass any anywhere without looking at it and getting upset by it. Mars, what does the future, We I know we touched on it, um, but before we finish up, I want to ask you, what does the future hold for um, the industry, um, the profession, the space? I, I, I think what needs to be dealt with right now is that the Mutilation of young men mm. in place has to be stopped and some form of regulation brought in. Mm. Uh, the, there are seriously good research um, societies looking at hair loss and how to deal with it. Mm. Um, but the fundamentals haven't changed. And I'm, as I said, we're in weekly contact with one of the best research laboratories in the world. It's, Growing hair, I've seen hair growing in the lab, but it's not suitable for transplantation. Mm. So progress has obviously been made, but because hair is such a complex organ, to be able to grow ten thousand hairs up in the lab in UCD, send them down to HRBR, and then we pop them in on a Saturday morning, that's mythology at the moment. Mm. But it would be nice to be able to harvest hair from somebody grow it in a lab, reproduce thousands of them, 
and then transplanted it back into the person's scalp because it's their own um, genes that mm. you're putting in. And we tried uh, transplanting identical brothers, putting hair from one into the other, and it won't take. The skin is very antigenic and it will reject anybody else's hair. Mm. So I, I'd love to say there's something super duper coming around the corner. Um, the the medical treatments are getting more efficient. Um, we use a combination of two drugs, finasteride and minoxidil, to stabilize the hair loss. We have a tablet version of what was usually regained, a topical application, very commonly used. We now have a tablet version of that. And 90% of people will benefit from that. And if you can stabilize somebody's hair loss, that's a huge benefit, mm. uh, particularly young men. The youngest patient I've ever seen was 14. And by the age of 17, despite all our best efforts, the top of his head was bald. Tragic. Mm. His poor dad was more upset than he was. Thankfully, he got good, good bone structure and he, he, you know, he had accepted it at that age. But hair loss ages people prematurely in the front mm. of the head. Um, there was a, I don't know whether you're interested in golf, but Tiger Woods won the Masters a couple of years ago. And on the 18th green, he looked like the typical Tiger on Sunday, the black hat, the red shirt, and he was playing magnificent golf. And it looked like nothing had happened. Mm. And he took the hat off to shake hands on the 18th green and a, a, a gasp went up from the crowd because this old man appeared out of nowhere. There's and a famous, there's famous photographs of that moment, right? It, there is a, it's extensive and it's patchy as well. It's the, it's the premature aging effect. Mm. And a lot of men will, um, I had some golfers and they'll, when they're going through passport control, they have great difficulty taking the cap off when they're showing their passport to the passport officer. We'd one very funny one going into St. Petersburg in Russia. One of our patients was returning home and he he showed his passport photograph and the, the guys didn't recognize him. <laughs> and he was hauled into the room and they were trying to, there was a language problem. So he just Show them the incision line on the back of the head, and the whole thing changed. Congratulations! Shook his hand. You look mm. great. And all went through. It's um, it really is a, a, um, extraordinary um, the work that you're doing. Um, and I'm I, I'm very proud. We have a wonderful team. It's not me. Mm. I, I'm the I'm the medical director. I have the most phenomenal team of nurses, technicians, and other doctors who work with me. Mm. I'm only the team leader. And, you know, people think everybody goes to Turkey. We've operated on patients from 50 different countries. So I, ha I had a doctor came from Melbourne this year to have repair work done in our clinic. Wow. Get, I've had a lot of patients from Singapore, Cayman Islands, States, and the fellow come from San Diego next month. Um, so we get patients from literally all over the world coming to Ireland. And it's something I'm incredibly proud of. Because it's and I say it's not me, it's it's a team of dedicated professionals. And my advice to everybody who has hair loss, and I'd like to finish on that, is mm. God said, please get proper advice from a qualified doctor. Do not rush into a hair transplant. The, the, the only thing, Mark, it might be, there could be a prohibitive cost factor. And that's obviously driving people um, to places like, like Turkey and, and areas of the world that they really shouldn't be going to. Can you imagine over time that it might, um, through economies of scale or something, that the, the, the general costs might come down or... Have they come down over the years? We 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 have because of the competition from Turkey. Mm. 
much and all as I'd like to increase our costs, and our costs are huge because we do the job properly. The fundamental cost of doing a hair transplant is very, very expensive. Mm. There's, there's such a large team of people involved. Mm. You know, if, if you're doing 3,000 individual grafts in mm. one day, mm. just think you have what an you're army doing. of people. You're keeping them alive by the mm. right side of the body. You're getting them back into the into the skin within four hours. You know that that's technically that is mind blowing what we're doing, mm. and and it's very costly to do that. Mm. And I I set out to do the best hair transplants in the world, not the cheapest. Mm. And my advice to somebody is: look, nobody needs a hair transplant if you can't afford to have the best hair transplant. Mm. For God's sake. She cut your hair short, groom it, get a really good hairdresser to groom your hair, or as your dad did, get a really good hairpiece. You know, Mark, he's Mark, lived satisfactorily with that for many, many years. Yeah. And do you know if there's any medical insurance coverage, or is that a possibility, or is it? In, no, um, they, uh, uh, we we're working with uh, Crumlin Children's Hospital now in doing hair transplantation into hairlines and eyebrows mm. in people who've had um, injuries or um, very the injuries are the usual ones we see. And this service is not available in the public health system. There's no hair transplantation in the public health system. Mm. And, you know, can you imagine, um, you know, I have one little boy, he was injured in a motor car accident he was only seven, and he had scars on the scalp, and also on on the eyebrow and the hairline, and we were able to transplant that, and the scars are now invisible, so he can groom his hair in the modern styling, and he's now fourteen, mm. so he would have had to live with that mm. throughout his life. Had we not been in a position to help him, mm. and thankfully, the as I said, we're working closely with Cromlin now, and we've had other patients who um, have had support from the health service, and you can get tax relief on your hair transplant, but not for cosmetic purposes. Mm. Um, it was available when I started; you could put the whole bill in and get tax relief on the lot. But now it's only if it's uh, secondary to a medical condition, like a head injury or a cancer treatment or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, brilliant. Dr. Morris Collins, that was absolutely endlessly fascinating. And uh, I just am I'm in total admiration of the work that you've done and continue to do to keep doing what you do. Thanks, Conor. I'm very passionate about it. And I think that's what thoroughly comes across in this conversation as well. So thank you so much. Very nice meeting you, Connor. Lovely Bye. to meet you too. Pleasure.